Good morning, church. How we doing? Good. It's great to be with you. Really excited to be together on a Sunday. And today we're kicking off a new series called Life, Money, Legacy. Life, Money, Legacy. Here's what this series is all about. We believe that God has called you, John chapter 10, verse 10, to experience the abundant life of Jesus Christ. And we believe that God has called you to use your life to make a difference, that your life should be marked by meaning and purpose that carries on into eternity. But neither of those things can, can happen. Neither of those things is possible. Your, your abundant life in Christ, your, your legacy that God's called you to leave is not possible if you don't understand how to manage the money that God has entrusted to your care. And so what we're going to do in this series, this four-week series, we're going to help you learn the biblical mindset. And mindset's the biggest thing I'm going to help you with because mindset changes everything because all money does, if you get more money, all it does is, is exaggerate who you already are. So, so if we help you with savings and debt and spending and all that different stuff and you become a very wealthy person, if, if at your core you are a greedy person, more money will just make you more greedy. If you're a generous person, more money will just make you more generous. And so money just makes you more of who you already are. And so the, the main thing we're going to focus on is mindset. But what I want to help you with, I want to help you walk in the abundant life of Jesus Christ, which starts by learning how to manage our money before the Lord. And so what I want to start with before we jump into anything else is, is a, a one verse that hopefully helps alleviate the reason why I can hear a pin drop in this room right now. Because <laughs> some of y'all are like, oh, money. You're like checking your wallet's still there. No usher like swiped it from you on your way in the door. You're looking for the, the, the picture of the child who's starving in Africa. You know, you're just, you're feeling a little bit like, man, there it is. Church just wants my money. And actually, one of the reasons that, that we talk about this is because early on in my pastoral journey, I never talked about this. Although Jesus talked about money more than he talked about any other topic, more than he talked about heaven and hell, he talked about money because he said, Matthew 6, you can love God or you can love money, but you can't love both. You have to pick which one is going to sit on the throne in your life, and money more than any other thing will, will come after your affections. Money will tell you it can do things for you that God is supposed to do for you. Money, money will tell you, I'll keep you safe. Money will tell you, I'll make you happy. Money will tell you, I'll give you the life you dream of. And God is the one who says, I'll keep you safe. He's the one who says, I'll make you happy. He's the one who says, I'll put you into eternity. God is the one who can do all these things. Money can't do all these things. But when we buy the lie that money can do these things, we end up replacing God with a spirit called mammon. But, but here's what I want you to know. We're not going to guilt you. We're not going to coerce you. We're not going to try and manipulate you into giving. I'm never going to come up here and say, hey, we need you to give. If you don't give, kids are going to die. And for anybody who's been under that kind of leadership, I just want to say I'm sorry. That's a horrible representation of Christ and the church. It's a horrible representation of what Jesus came to do. Can I just say this to you? God is not interested in your money. He doesn't need your money. He owns it all. He could take it all from you in a moment. He doesn't need you to give it. He can get what he wants when he wants. I love what Keith read, Revelation chapter 5, that, that all glory and honor and wealth belongs to him. It's all going to go before him one day. Actually, I was thinking as Keith read that, it's the first time it's ever clicked in my brain that, that what the three wise men did in the nativity scene where they brought their treasures before Jesus, that's a little picture of what's going to happen in Revelation chapter 5. That all the treasures of the earth come before the Lord and it's all his. All the wealth, all the honor, all the glory goes to him. He doesn't need your money. What he wants is your heart. And he knows there is, a, there is an unbreakable tie to the things in your hands, your possessions, your wealth, and your heart and your affections. That's why he says your, your heart goes where your treasure is. Wherever your treasure goes, there's a string on your heart, and your heart just follows right after it. If you want to love your sports team more, just invest more money into it. If you want to love your kids more, just put more money into them. If anything you put money into, you begin to love a whole lot. That's why those of you who graduated from certain universities, you are diehard fans. Why? Because tens of thousands of dollars <laughs> of your money went to that university. And now you don't miss a game. Why? Because, man, I put all my money there. That's where my treasure That's where my heart is, too. So we're not going to manipulate you, coerce you. Here's what 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 said. Each one must give as he has decided. God wants you to be a decider in your heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You could give all your money and be mad about it, and God says, I'm not interested. 
You could give your leftovers. You could tip God. You could come in church every Sunday and drop a 20 in the offering. And God says, I'm not interested. I don't want your money. I don't want you to appease your guilt. I want your heart. That's what he's after this morning. And I think this is maybe the most critical topic for many of your lives. Because we live in the, most, the wealthiest country in the history of the world. And many of us still feel like we don't have enough because we're believing a lie that somehow money's going to give us what only God can give us. This is a spiritual topic far more than it's a practical topic, which is why I just want to start by prayer, asking God to do only what he can do in our hearts. And so, Father, I ask you in the heart of every single person in this room, in my heart, God, would you, would you make the scales fall from our eyes? God, would you break the love of money in our hearts and help us to put you on your rightful throne? Would we love you and honor you above all else? In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, all God's people said? Amen. Amen. Would you stand to your feet with me to honor the reading of God's word? We're going to be in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 through 12. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 through 12. I'm going to read it to you. Man, it's kind of hard to see with all those polka dots, isn't it? I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to say this is the word of the Lord, and then you're going to say amen, okay? Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, For I, the Lord, do not change, therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions? You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. This is the word of the Lord and all God's people said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I've got three main points for you this morning. And the first one is simply this, that God is first and God went first. If you're going to understand how to manage your money before the Lord, you have to understand this, that God is first and God went first. Say, he's first. First. Say it again. Say, he's first. First. God is first and God went first. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. You need to know this about God. He is an unchanging God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. That's a reason for a good amen. Amen. I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O Jacob, children of Jacob, are not consumed. Okay, you need to understand this, that the reason God has shown you mercy, the reason Jesus died on the cross for you, the reason God poured out his love for you is not because of you. It's not because you're awesome. It's not because you deserved it. Actually, the Bible says all we deserved was eternal death for our sins. The reason he showed you mercy is because he is merciful. The reason God is generous to you is not because you have a need. It's because he is generous. All that God does is according to who God is. His character and nature determines what he does. He says in verse 7, from the days of your fathers, you've turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Here's what he's saying. You are a sinful, wicked people. You are a black-hearted, cold-hearted, evil, wicked sinner before you meet Jesus. And you come from a line of sinners. Your daddy was a sinner. His daddy was a sinner. His daddy was a sinner. Like, that's what he's saying. And he says the only reason that you have hope to stand before the one true living God and not be immediately consumed by fire is because of the mercy of God himself. If you're coming in here saying, man, the gospel is just that that I'm awesome and God adds a little bit to my life, or I'm good and I just need a little bit of help, you have not understood the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ says you are wicked, you are sinful, you have spit in the face of a holy and good and perfect God, and only by grace can you be saved. Man, I wish you understood it more because you'd say a bigger amen when I said that. (laughs) Only by grace can you be saved. 
Amen. There you go. Romans chapter 5 tells us, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God didn't wait for you to clean up your act. God didn't wait for you to come to him. No, no, no. God went first because God is first. For God so loved the world, John 3, 16 tells us that he gave his only begotten son. God gave because God loved. He went while we were still sinners. That whoever believes in him should not perish but inherit eternal life. This is critical. Why did God go first? Because he is first. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. There's none like him, none before him, and none after him. He is the Lord Almighty. This is called the preeminence of God or the preeminence of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying God wants to be first. You have to hear this. I'm saying he is first. God has never been second place, and he never will be second place. He is first. He is before all things. Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. When you understand that God is first and God went first, it changes everything in your life. When you look at the Shema, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 5, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We don't serve a multitude of gods like Hinduism, 33 million gods. We don't do that. We have one God, three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall, because he's one, because he's God, because he's first, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Your whole life should be holistically devoted to him. This word means that not only is God the first on your list of priorities, God is the paper on which you list your priorities. God is first and God went first in his son Jesus Christ. And it's because of that that the first and the best of our wealth, it's not even ours, God owns it all. But the first and the best of all that he's put in our hands belongs to him. It's because he is first and he went first that the first and the best belongs to the Lord. Malachi 3, 7 says this, Return to me and I'll return to you, says the Lord of hosts. It's an invitation to repentance. God is saying through the prophet Malachi, Hey, listen, I don't care how far you've gone. I don't care how bad you've been. I don't care how much you've sinned. If you return to me, I'll return to you. It's an invitation to repentance based upon the mercy of of Almighty God. He says, and the people say, how shall we return? It's an authentic question. And God retorts with a question. Will man rob God, yet you are robbing me? But you say, how have we robbed you? I don't think anybody in this church would be like, yeah, Dylan, you're right, I've been robbing God. Actually, I was trying to pick the lock on the offering box last week, and I just couldn't I couldn't get it, but man, I think this week's my week. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get my hand in that plate and rob God. I don't think anybody's doing that. And if you are, we've actually been praying about starting a prison ministry, and I'd love for you to be involved in it <laughs> as a participant. All right? I just, I would love that. Okay? So how were they robbing God? How, how is that happening? He says, in your tithes and contributions. Say, so Dylan, what's a tithe? A tithe simply means a tenth or 10%. It's a mathematical term, not a spiritual term. Okay, it was the standard in the Old Testament for how much we're to bring to God. And contributions are anything above and beyond the tithe. That's why at King's Church we say generosity doesn't start until after the tithe. The the tithe is just returning to God what belongs to him. It's after the 10% that generosity kicks in. And and some of you Bible nerds will say, Dylan, that's the Old Testament. We're New Testament Christians. That's the Old Covenant. We're in the New Covenant. And I would say, amen. I agree. And you say, well, that's under Jewish law. We're not under Jewish law anymore. I agree. 613 Jewish laws, Jesus fulfilled every single one of them in his life, death, and resurrection. Come on, can I get a good amen in the house? He, he did it all for us. You're not coming to God based on what you do. You're coming to God based upon what Jesus has done on the cross for us. And yet, the principle of the tithe pre and post dates the law. So are we under law? No. But the principle of the tithe pre pre and post dates the law. And if you look through the scriptures, you'll see that those who received a revelation of God or received the grace of God always responded by giving their first and best to the Lord in the form of first fruits or a tithe. Look at Genesis chapter 14. 
The first time you see it is actually Genesis chapter 4 with Cain and Abel, but I don't have time to get to that today. I'm going to try and slip it in next week. But the next time you see it is Genesis chapter 14. And this is talking about Abram, who would then become Abraham. Two chapters prior, Abraham or Abram received the promise that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars of the heavens. Chapter 14, he meets Melchizedek, who is the priest of the Lord. And Abram gives to Melchizedek as a way to give to the Lord of all that God has given to him. This is what uh, chapter 14, verse 20 says. It says, Abram gave him a what? A tenth, 10%, the tithe, before the law, of everything he owned. Abram said, God blessed me and spoke to me, therefore I'm going to put him first in my life by returning to him what is his in the tithe. He gave a tenth of all that he had. This is how you put God first in your life, is you first put him first in your finances. It reminds me of a guy named Adolfo in our church in St. Louis. Adolfo was this really sweet Hispanic man who walked chihuahuas for a living. He had like 13 chihuahuas. Incredible guy. I love him. And uh, no joke, it's a real story. And uh, Adolfo comes to me. He became a Christian a few years prior. He comes to me and says, Pastor, I'm done. I'm, I, I got to get right with God. I've not been returning to him what belongs to him. He said, I have $13,000 in my bank account. I'm writing a check today for $1,300, a tenth of everything that I own. And he, he wrote the check, and I walked him over to the offering box, and he put it in. And I said, Adolfo, well done, man. He said, Dylan, this isn't, I'm not just returning what I already own. From this day forward, every dollar God gives me, I'm going to give a tenth back to him. Adolfo calls me a week later and says, Pastor, you wouldn't believe it. My car broke down. Guess how much it's going to cost to fix it? I said, how much? He said, $1,300. The exact amount he had given to the Lord the week before, his car breaks down and now he owes another 10%, $1,300. Sometimes when you give, God returns a blessing to you by increasing your finances. And sometimes when you give, God returns a blessing to you by breaking the love of money in your heart. Adolfo said to me, he said, Pastor, I know God's testing me and I'm not going to go back on what he called me to do. I'm going to keep being faithful with what he's given to me. I think God set him free that day. And, and I, last time I talked to him, he's doing amazing in his faith. Look at Jacob. He's on his way to Haran, and he finds a spot to sleep. And he's a baller, so instead of getting a pillow, he grabs a stone and puts his head on a stone to fall asleep. I think that's why he never got REM sleep, and he, he actually understood his dreams. Okay, I just sleep so deep, I never actually know what I dreamed, all right? But, but uh, he never got in a rim, and so he actually understood his dreams. But he gets this dream from the Lord, this, this ladder from heaven, and angels are ascending and descending on the ladder. And it's this picture of Christ coming down for his people, and, and it's this promise from God over his life. And this is how Jacob responds. He says, this stone which I have set up at, for a pillar shall be God's house. He says, I'm going to take this stone as a stone of remembrance, and I'm going to build the house of God with it. And, and then what does he do? Remember, it's pre-law. He says, of all that you give me, every dollar that comes through these hands for the rest of my life, I'm returning a tenth to you. The 10%, the tithe before the law. Jacob recognized all that he had was a gift from God. And to honor the Lord, he was going to trust God by returning the first 10% to him. Giving the first and the best is the natural response of the person who's received God's grace. And if I could just shoot straight with you for a second. Having preached the gospel, I've been a pastor for over 10 years. I, I've noticed there's a direct correlation between how close you are with the Lord and how you respond to generosity. I, I've noticed that those people whose hearts get far from God become less and less generous. And the people whose hearts get closer to the Lord, like when they kind of get woken up in their soul, you can't stop them from being generous. Why is that? Because at the heart of your father is a generous heart. Your God is a giving God, and the closer you get to him, the more you will love to give. So you ask Dylan, what did Israel tithe on? What did they give the first and the best of? Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, a tithe of everything. Somebody shout everything. everything. A tithe of everything. From the land, whether the grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. There's a few things here. First of all, he said everything. This is an agricultural society. 
So they said grain from the soil, fruit from the trees. They said that, but we could say this. A tithe of everything I got from my paycheck two weeks ago. A tithe of everything I made on that sale. A tithe of everything I made when I sold my house. A tithe on everything from that deal I closed. A tithe on every tip that I got as a waitress. A tithe on everything that we have. Rebecca and I have been married 12 years. Before we got married, I became a Christian. And shortly after becoming a Christian, my uh, friend of mine set me down. And he said, Dylan, are you returning to God what belongs to God? I said, no, I'm not. And he taught me about the tithe, and I began the practice of tithing. Same was true in Rebecca's life. When we got married, we automatically, we began the practice of tithing. For 12 years, to the best of my knowledge, there's not a dollar that's passed through these hands that we've not returned the first 10% to the Lord. Oftentimes, given above and beyond that. I'm not telling that to boast to myself. I'm telling you that to say, this is a conviction that you live by. Rebecca and I said early on in our marriage, we said, whether if we had to choose between food on the table and tithe in the storehouse... We're choosing tithe in the storehouse, and we're trusting that God will put food on our table. It's a conviction that you got to get deep in your soul, and if you don't, your season will go like this, and in the valleys, you'll always neglect to put God first. It's just what will happen in your life. You've got to live with a conviction and a resolve to say, there will not be a day of my life that God is not first in my life, and it starts by making him first in your finances. He says it belongs to the Lord. I think this is why Malachi can say, will man rob God? Because the tithe belongs to the Lord. I I illustrate it this way often. If I gave you 20 bucks and said, will you buy me a gallon of milk? You can keep the change. Just bring me back a gallon of milk. This illustration used to work because a gallon of milk was like $2. (laughs) Maybe it's like if I gave you $100, you know, (laughs) buy me a gallon of milk. And, uh, and you took the $100 and you ran off with it. You didn't bring me the milk. What did you do? You stole my money. If I gave you $100 and you brought me back the milk and I said, you can keep the change. That's a greater picture of what the Lord does with us. So why does he say, well, man, rob God? Because when you take something that doesn't belong to you, that's called stealing. There's three ways to view your possessions. First way is selfishness. It's when you believe mine is mine. That's what kids do. Mine. Mine. You be eating a sandwich, my little two-year-old. Mine. You know, it's just like, that's kids. It's selfish. Second way, second way to view your money is when you believe that yours is mine. That's called stealing or socialism, but we don't have time to go there, okay? So. <laughs> the third way to view your money is when you believe mine is God's. That's called stewardship. We don't want to be selfish. We don't want to be stealing. We want to be stewards, where you say, what's mine is God's. The second thing he says here is he says, it's holy to the Lord. It's holy to the, it means it's set apart for God. The tithe is set apart for God. What that means is that when you return to the Lord, what is his, the first 10% of all that you receive, when you do that, whether you do it online, whether you do it through the app, whether you do it through, like Rebecca and I, automated giving, it just automatically comes out so we never forget. Whether you do it in the offering box, however you give it, it's not a financial transaction. It is a spiritual act of worship. It is holy to the Lord. It's been set aside to him and him alone. It's a very spiritual thing what you do with what God has put in your hands. I love uh, how Jesus says it in Matthew chapter 6. It's after he's talked about you can love God or you can love money, but you can't love both. It's in the context of the passage where uh, it's the Sermon on the Mount. It's the longest section of teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And, and he's talking to a people who are anxious about their life. Anybody relate? Anxious about your bills, anxious about inflation, anxious about the groceries. These people are anxious about their life. And Jesus is teaching about money, and he says, look at the birds of the air. And I don't know if birds flew by. I, I mean, he's Jesus, right? He could have been teaching about it, and he's like, cue the birds, you know, and then the birds fly by. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know. And he's like, hey, look at the birds, you know. Look at the birds of the air. They're not doing anything. You know birds don't have a 401k? You know not a single bird has ever checked the stock market. <laughs> birds don't show up to a nine to five. Birds don't have a, but, but God feeds the birds. And Jesus is like, are you serious? The birds got more faith than you? And he says, look at the lilies of the field. They're more beautiful than Solomon in all of his glory. Those birds, the, the lilies of the field, they look better than you do in those fancy pants that you bought that you can't afford. 
And you're looking in the mirror, I gotta have them, I gotta, and you set up a payment plan for your pants, right? That's just craziness. The lilies look better than you, you know, and, and he's like, God clothes them. Won't he clothe? He's gonna take care of your food, he's gonna take care of your shelter, he's gonna take care of you. Why? Because he's a good God and he loves you. But Matthew 6 says, But seek first, say first, the kingdom of God, put God first. And his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. What are all these things? All the things we worry about. Okay, God is first and God went first in Jesus Christ. The first and best belongs to God. Number three, God blesses those who return the first and best to him. God blesses those who return the first and best to him. I'm going to teach it and I'm going to address something some of you are probably already thinking. God blesses those who return the first and best to him. Malachi chapter 3 verse 9, you are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me the whole nation of you. You're cursed with a curse, a strong language. That's what the Bible says. Now, we're not under the curse because we're under the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Whoa. We're not under the curse because we're under the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Okay, you worried me. Whew, what have I done all these years? Okay, so uh, we're going to do just gospel 101 a couple weeks from now. Okay, so... Uh, and yet he says your, your finances are under curse. Now, now, just to modernize that, some of you are living life paycheck to paycheck. You're stressed out. The bills are due. You're in piles of debt. You're fighting. Your marriage is just marked by strife and conflict. You're, there's, there's strife and conflict in your home. There's not peace over your life. What is it? It's a curse. Because you've not done it God's way. You've not put God first in your finances. And this, I'm not talking about a Cadillac and cotton candy. I'm not sure how much of that we need. I'm talking about the peace of God, the grace of God, the blessing of God when we put him first in our life. He says, you're cursed with a curse. The whole nation of you is robbing God. He goes on, he says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse so there may be food in my house. Notice he says, bring. It's hard to put a bring button on the website, you know, so we put a give button on the website. But I try hard in my communication to never say, hey, give your tithes to the Lord, but bring them, return them. Why? Because you can't give something that isn't yours. I'll say to you this way. If you said to me, Pastor, can I borrow your car? Your, your, can I borrow your car for, for a couple weeks? And I said, yeah, sure, of course you can borrow my car. No problem. Gave you the keys. And two weeks from, from now you come back and you say, Pastor, i got a gift for you. I have an extravagant gift, a radical gift, a gift of radical generosity. Meet me in the parking lot after church. Okay, all right, now we're talking. You know, like, <laughs> what's up? And uh, you hand me my set of keys and you say, I want to present to you a used 2013 to Toyota Corolla. I would say, you, you fool, that's my car. <laughs> you borrowed my car. What do you mean you're giving me a gift, right? Like this, That's not a gift. You're just returning to me what already belongs to me. That's what the tithe is. We're just bringing, we're just bringing what's already his into the storehouse. It's his. He says, bring the full tithe. That means you bring what's first and best to him. Some people ask me, Dylan, do you tithe off the gross or off the net, before the taxes or after the taxes? I would return the question, is what's more important, God or government? Which one is it to you? Because remember, it's an issue of priority, what's first in your life. Personally, we always tithe off the gross. Why? Because we're making a statement with our money, God's first before anybody else. It comes out for us the first of every month. Why? Because I want to put it in God's hands before it ever touches my groceries, my mortgage, my bill, anything else. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse. Some people say, Pastor, I, I give 2% to the church and 2% to United Way and 2% to this. And I say, that's awesome you give to those things, but you're not tithing to the Lord. You're not bringing the full tithe because the tithe goes into the storehouse. What is the storehouse? Old Testament, it's the temple. New Testament, it's the church. That's why you see in the book of Acts that the people of God sold their possessions and laid it at the apostles' feet. Why? Because they're bringing it into the storehouse. And just to be real frank, can I, can I shoot straight with you? Good, because I'm going to. <laughs> Some of you would say, but pastor, I can't trust the church with the full 10%. And I would say, you trust us with your soul, but not with your money. You have very misordered priorities. And I would just encourage you, if, if you can't trust this house, go to a house that you can trust. And return, bring the full tithe into the storehouse. I've said since the day we started the church, if you need to tithe to a different church, just so you know, I'm not talking about this because we need your money. 
go do it. I'd love to recommend 10 churches in town for you to just bless their socks off with your tithe until you come to a place. But if, if you can't ever get there, you need to go somewhere that you can trust. Because this is an issue of your soul. It's not just about your money. He says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Why does God say bring the full tithe? Because God wants food in his house. What is food? Food is ministry. It's, it's the ministry of the word, which is the bread of life. Why would you bring the full tithe into the storehouse? Because, so that we can do more ministry so that we can feed more hungry people, so that we can rescue more women and children out of sex trafficking, so that we can welcome the refugee, so that we can reach and train a generation for Christ, so that more people might call on his name. Why would you bring the full tithe into the storehouse? Because it's the place to bring it to see the work of God spread across the world. But let me say this, if you're going to bring the full tithe into the storehouse, if you're going to preach that, you better run a tight storehouse. And that's why we take, we take it very, very serious to steward all that God brings into this house. We hire a third-party accounting company. I don't have a key to that box in the back of the auditorium. Uh, we have a CPA that audits our books at the end of every year. We have a treasurer who oversees all of our finances. We have a board that oversees all that. We take it very serious to run a tight storehouse because this is the word of God, and we need to steward that the best we possibly can. He says, thereby put me to the test. It's the only time God says, put me to the test says the Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down a blessing until there's no more need. Can I just say, I'm not trying to get something from you. I'm trying to get this to you, that you would live under an open heaven because when you open your hands to God, he opens the heavens over your life. There's a famous radio preacher, Dr. David Jeremiah. He's an old dude and he was teaching about the tithe at his church. This young couple comes to him and says, Pastor, we're just really anxious, we're nervous. And he says, how about this? How about you write a check for the tithe at the beginning of the month, and I'll set it on my desk. And if at the end of the month, if you need it, I'll just give it back to you. I won't cash it till the end of the month. And this young couple said, Pastor, that'd be so nice. We'd really like it. Thank you so much. That really helps us. And he took the check, and he ripped it in front of him and said, how dare you trust me more than you trust God? That's what old dudes get to do when they preach. They just, <laughs> they just say baller stuff, you know, like, watch out. 20 years, that's me, okay? Like, I'm going to bring it to you. The question is, do you trust God? Not do you trust the church, not do you trust people. Do you trust God, and will you return to him what belongs to him? And listen, God is a God of blessing. He will open the heavens over your life. I told you I would address this earlier. There's, there's a heresy in the church today called the prosperity gospel. The prosperity, here's what the prosperity gospel says. If you give to God, God will give to you health, wealth, and prosperity. Here's the heresy of the prosperity gospel. It puts you at the center of the situation. It puts you first, not God first. It's about what you get, not about what you give to him. There's, a, there's an equal heresy on the other side called the poverty gospel. The poverty gospel says in order to be spiritual, you have to be poor. Both of these are heresies. What we believe is that God is a God of blessing. We preach the blessing gospel. That God promised to bless his people when they trusted and walked with him. And if you survey the scriptures, you'll see that that was true again and again and again and again and again. And sometimes being blessed meant you got to be counted with the martyrs and give your life for the name of Jesus Christ. We don't believe in either heresy. We believe in the truth. Can I tell you why some of you golf clap, many of you golf clap when I talk about money or bring it up at the beginning of the message and you go, eh? And some of you get really excited and you go, sweet, let's talk about it. I love being generous. This is awesome. I'll tell you why. Relevant Magazine did a, did a study years ago. and they, they tried to figure out what percentage of the American church actually returns to God a tithe. And the study came back and said 15% of the American church, people who have been forgiven by Jesus, who Jesus paid for with his blood, people whom he was, he was nailed to that cross for, 15% returned the tithe. And I, I saw this, uh, maybe it was last week or the week before, and I called Dan. Dan helps to oversee a lot of the financial health kind of here locally at King's. And I said, hey, man, let's, let's figure this out. What's the percentage at King's Church? And, and kind of the report came back, and we just ran average household income in Kansas City Metro, which is less than Lee Summit. And the uh, report came back 13%, the best we can tell, 13% of King's Church returns to God, the first and the best. 
And, uh, I mean, and honestly, I was just like, have I failed at teaching this, preaching this? Have I failed at helping people put God first in their finances? And pretty quickly, I was like, gosh, man, that must be horrible in the home, in your heart. The anxiety, the stress, the, the fear, the arguments. I mean, I'll talk about Cain and Abel next week, but I mean, just the absolute destruction of the home because he, they failed to give God the first and the best. And I, I just want to say, like, man, this is a big deal for your life with God. This is a big deal for your relationship with the Lord. And in the same article, they said, if the church in America actually returned to God the full tithe into the storehouse, it would be equivalent to $165 billion in the church across America. That's, that's billion with a B. Let me show you what could happen if the church in America actually did this. Uh, $25 billion would re re relieve global hunger and death from preventable disease in five years. $12 billion would eliminate global illiteracy in five years. $15 billion could solve the world's water and sanitation issues. And $1 billion could, currently fu could fund all current overseas missionaries from America. That would leave us about $110 billion to figure out how to bless more people. Uh, if I showed you the numbers on King's Church, I mean, we could, we could quadruple the ministry we're doing if the church was just faithful with what God's called us to do. Let me say again, God's not interested in your money. He's interested in your heart. This is ultimately a heart issue. And if we put God first in our finances, this is what he promises. Verse 11, I'll rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruit of your soil and the vine in your field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Let me put that in modern terms. Your provision would no longer be in your hands, but it would be in the hands of Almighty God. He goes on, he says, the nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Some of you don't give because of FOMO, fear of missing out. You don't give because you're like, what could I spend that on? What, what trip could I take? What thing could I buy? I'll tell you this, Rebecca and I, we return the tithe because we're afraid of missing out on God's blessings. We're afraid of missing out on God opening the heavens over our life and doing what we could never imagine him doing only by his grace. I want to invite you today to make a decision. For some of you, it'll be the greatest decision you've ever made in your life, second only to becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. I want to invite you this week to upend your life, to flip your finances on your head, and to put God first in your financial life. Actually, on every chair, there's a little card called the, uh, the Tithe Challenge. Would you grab that out and just show it to me? Every single person in the room, just, you don't have to use it, just grab it and show it to me. Grab it and show it to me. Yeah, Tithe Challenge, there you go. Okay, you got it. Here's my invitation. I want to ask every single person, whether you turn that card in to us or not, I really don't care. If you want to, you can, but you don't need to. This is for you. I want to invite you to take a challenge the next 90 days and simply say, I'm putting God first in my finance. You say, Dylan, what does that mean? It means you take your gross household income, you times it by 10%. My, my son could do this math, but some of y'all, you might need a calculator. I love you, but you're just not good at it. You know, you, you say 10%, one-tenth. And you take that number, and you go on the website, and you plug it in, that number to the general fund, and you set up an automated gift that every month I'm just going to give a tenth of what God has given to me. And watch what he does in your heart and in your life over the next 90 days as you do that. Before we move on, I want to show you the testimony of a couple who did just that earlier this year and what God has done in their life. My name is Jason Sneller. I'm Ashton Sneller, and we have two beautiful baby girls, Raylan and Harper. And we live in Lee Summit and have been going to King's Church for about two years and have been members for a year and a half. God definitely changed my life by going to King's because uh, we were going there for about a year and I learned how I need to surrender myself to the Lord. And uh, that's when I was baptized just back around April and uh, it changed my life. I've never really had much of an experience as far as um, generosity goes in a church. I've kind of always just set up an automatic withdrawal. Last year, around August, um, we were blessed with the birth of our second child, which also meant more bills and daycare bills. And on top of life being as everyone knows, very expensive. 
just to do anything anymore. Um, my job, I'm a mortgage loan officer for a broker's and I was on a salary plus commission and my salary went away. So I had to pivot to full commission, um, leaning on referrals and I just moved here two years ago and so I had like two realtors in my pipeline of people to help me with business and um, was very scared with what the future was going to hold with our um, upcoming expenses and decrease in income. Um, didn't think I could make it, was already looking for other jobs. And there were times where you know, I, I had a good month in like September and I decided to covet some of that money because you know, I thought we needed it at home. And you know, I realized I was stealing from God. And when I changed my heart, my mindset to, okay, that first 10% is his. It's not what's left over at the end of the month. It goes to him no matter what. It's not ours. Um, and so really made an emphasis on being relational with God and changing my posture of, of giving. It's not necessarily about the amount um, initially, I think. It's just like what Jason said, just having the heart to give um, and being faithful to our God, especially as precious as money can be in our society. Um, when in reality, it's not the most important thing uh, because we won't have money when we go to heaven. All those tangible things, so. Yeah, Thanksgiving service, um, you know, we went and brought our checkbook for whatever reason, and, you know, Dylan asked if anybody, you know, wanted to give anything, whatever was on your heart, um, to the Thanksgiving service, that's, that's pretty normal. And for some reason, I just kept being told, like, you need to give this amount of money to the dollar, give this amount of money. So we sat down, prayed about it, wrote the check, put it in the box, lost money that month, but we were gonna do it and be faithful. And uh, a week later, we got a check in the mail because Ashton signed up for uh, like a hospital indemnity plan for the birth of our child through insurance. And that check that came in the mail matched our Thanksgiving deposit to the dollar. And that was just like, okay, I see what you're doing. Like, I know we're gonna be okay. And then uh, fast forward in March, business is, is, is growing for me and um, I end up having my best month of my career in March, um, just a few months after not knowing if I could even do this job. There are seriously some months where I don't even know where some of these uh, loans come from. I had a lady call me from Florida who's moving to Lee Summit whose timeshare attorney referred them to Summit Lending and to ask specifically for Jason. Never heard of these people in my life. Still don't know who they really are. But she's buying a house and they asked for me. And I don't know, I don't really think that's random. I think the Lord is working in mysterious ways. And um, I, I choose to believe that that's a one of his many blessings of us giving faithfully and trusting in him and he will provide for us. Uh, it doesn't matter where it comes from, but he provides for us. And it's incredible to be a witness to it. So my faith has changed quite a bit. Come on, let's put our hands together. Hey, will you guys stand up? Come on, Jason and Ashton, stand up. Come on, come on church, celebrate them. Awesome. Thank you, guys. It takes a lot of courage to do that, and those guys are uh, just so humble in the way that they share their story. So many things in there that you see about how God works, and we just trust Him with what He has given to us. Like I said, that 90-day tithe challenge, this is my invitation to you. I know for many of you, this is going to be a radical shift in the way that you manage your money. And, and actually brought a set of dominoes, babe, if you could bring me those dominoes. Uh, I was going to do a little illustration for you, but just so you know, I did bring dominoes. I realized before the service my fingers are too wobbly. I couldn't get them to stay. All right, so the illustration isn't going to work. But this is the first domino in a line of dominoes. It, savings, we're going to talk about it. Investments, we're going to talk about it. Debt, we're going to talk about it. Your spending habits, the consumer culture that we live in, we're going to talk about it. But this is 
this issue of tithing, this issue of returning the first fruits to God, it's the first domino in a line of dominoes. And I want to invite you, you have five days before November 1st, I want to invite you to upend your world. Some of you may need to sell a car because that car payment for $700 a month, which is just ridiculous in the first place, you don't need it. You need four wheels and an engine that runs. That's all you need. You don't need to keep buying stuff with money you don't have to impress people you're never going to meet. Some of you need to upend your life this week. Some of you may need to downsize your house. Rebecca and I, when we moved to Kansas City, we were eight years into marriage. We were planting a church. We had two little kids. We had never lived in a single family home that we could call our own. We were just apartment living up until that point. And she had told me from day one of marriage, hey, one of my dreams, I want to buy a house, kind of nest and settle a little bit and kind of set up shop for the family. As a man, you can understand, eight years of that journey just got, I want to make this happen. Finally, 10 months into living here, we bought our kind of dream house, downtown Kansas City. And this giant house was a fixer-upper, but to us, it was a dream come true. And then we had some stuff fall through financially, and 55 days into owning that house, I turned to her in bed and said, we got to sell the house. Here's the deal. We could have kept the house if we just stopped giving. But we made a decision early in life. God was always going to be first in our life. We were never going to let something else take first place from him. And so... As a grown man with a wife and two kids, just bought our dream house. We took three weeks to fix it up. We put it on the market. We sold the house, and I moved in with my dad. It's humbling. Some of you are going to go through a very humbling few weeks, few months, maybe a few years. But I promise you, if you put God first, you will see him bless you like you've never known before. You'll have peace and grace on your life like you've never known before. I can't encourage you enough to take this step. We want to help you take it. We've got a page on our website. If you click the Give button, there's three options. One is financial resources. Okay, there's a whole page dedicated to budgeting and all this different stuff just to help you succeed in this area. But let me encourage you, take that tithe challenge, November 1st, start it, and watch what God does in your life. Will you stand to your feet with me? We're going to sing. Before we sing, I just want to pray over us. Father, I ask you to help us say yes to you to put you first. You went first and you are first. And I pray that we would return to you our first and our best. Not because we're trying to earn your love. You've already taken care of that by your mercy. But because you're a good and gracious father and this is our act of worship to give it all to you, Lord Jesus. Let's worship him.